Welcome to the Book of Romans. Uh, it's a joy to take you on a little mini lecture of some introductory thoughts on how we can at least set the stage for the importance of the book, why different uh, historical figures uh, have found the Book of Romans to be a critical theological piece from the Apostle Paul. We'll certainly look at the center of his theology on the word of justification by faith alone. We'll look at uh, some matters of eschatology uh, in, in terms of the end times and the already and not yet reality that seems to be the tension within our current context of the church. We'll look at some historical precedents, um, exegetical uh, concerns, and then at least deal with some of the, the highlights, the major themes that are uh, developing in this book. We'll give an outline toward the end of the mini lecture. So that will be a helpful way to frame how you might uh, go back and divide up the book into its rightful chapters and sub themes for your own uh, development. So join with me as we continue uh, in our mini lecture here. And I hope you are encouraged. I would uh, and challenge you maybe to get a notebook out so that you can take notes and follow along uh, on the journey that uh, we will be endeavoring to go on. When we think about the importance of the Book of Romans, we're struck by how individuals in the past looked at the book itself. Augustine, who influenced John Calvin, was struck by Romans chapter 13, verse 14, which records, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. This uh, really took on a special meaning for Augustine which led to his conversion. Later, Luther, not focusing on Romans uh, 13, but rather at the beginning of the introduction of Paul's letter, was struck in 1517, which really led to his conversion in Christ. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And he was struck by the weightiness of that verse which in, in many ways convicted him internally of all that he was looking at as he studied and began translating uh, Latin into German. He realized how far he was from the Lord, uh, even amidst, uh, amidst the rituals and traditions of the church. Uh, same passage, John Wesley, uh, probably much to the influence of, of Luther as well, uh, began to come to grips with full assurance in Christ. Again, reading Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Barth, Karl Barth, um, in 1918, while he was doing a pastorate in Switzerland, spent much time in the book of Romans. He, he, was, he was deeply moved by the Apostle Paul. Uh, theologically, he would be uh, in and against what we would as the evangelical movement today, but uh, what we can uh, at least appreciate what Barth did is that he spent um, uh, quite a bit of years developing uh, and publishing several chapters on the Book of Romans, and you'll note that he then is the later the founder of the Neo-Orthodox movement. It was away from the scripture um, as a divine revelation and really uh, thinking through the Messiah, the Christ, of scripture a little bit differently than maybe um, how we would see it today as evangelicals. Uh, that is another subject, but at least I want to point out um, these historical individuals who have been shaped by the book that Paul wrote. Romans, and certainly the book of Romans has in view here the tensions that exist uh, for the believer in respect to the age in which we're living, this age and the age to come. And, and right there in the middle of that circle is the coming together of, of the age in which the New Testament church was launched and the coming of God's spirit and then the promise of the age to come. It seems as if Paul is wrestling between the age in which he was living and the promise of new life, the promise of eternity, and he touches on um, some of these realities in the book. Some theologians would say that Paul here in the book of Romans, the epistle of Romans is deeply eschatological. 
uh, may, may not think in those terms like the book of Revelation or uh, maybe some other of, of Pauline epistles, but definitely there is that trajectory for Paul as he has this tension in mind. And, and this is why I believe he, he burst into um, a, a rather long chapter on uh, Romans chapter 8 and the standing in which the believer has. So he, he's moving um, from what he's already said it in chapter 9 and 10 about the doctrine of, of justification, the inclusion of Gentiles, uh, and the bringing in of the Gentiles uh, under uh, the, the branch and the trunk of the tree of Israel. Uh, and so we're then receiving the nutrients. And so he bursts into this joyful song in, in Romans 8, uh, declaring this tension, but but declaring what the Spirit has done in the life of the believer. And therefore, we can take courage and joy in knowing that we have assurance uh, in Christ and in Christ soon coming. Now, as we continue to uncover some of the introductory comments about the book of Romans, you will find that Paul has a tension. You know, there's the tension of the age in which he was living and occupying and the age in, in which he was longing for. And I think that is the tension that all believers have. There's the age in which we're living in right now and the age to come, that, that promise of uh, standing before our Messiah, the Lord Jesus. And so the age in which Paul is arguing is looking at the term justification, we're declared righteous. Then the age in which to come, which he argues in Romans chapter 8 about being glorified. The age in which we're living uh, and, and that the dead in Christ uh, will be buried. And then there's the promise of these bodies being changed into newness of life. So the age, the age in which we're living and occupying and the age to come. There's that little occupying space of when is the age to come going to then come into the age in which you're occupying. That leads us to other eschatological frameworks that uh, begin to get uncovered in the book, but also remains quite silent in the book as well, as well. Well, certainly the authorship of Romans in terms of uh, the center of, of Paul's argument is that he is arguing justification by faith. That's, that was Luther's argument. Uh, and his arguments are rather polemical in the sense that he's arguing against uh, those Judaizers that were, were adding both faith and law uh, in their expression of, of trusting and knowing the Lord. Uh, you'll note that the word justification uh, is connected to the term in Christ. So we're in Christ, and you'll see that over 164 times in its usage. Uh, and of course, uh, as already mentioned, the, the term of eschatology, the end of the era, the now of Paul's argument, uh, this expanse of Christianity, the kingdom of God has come into the age. It was Albert Schweitzer who who was wrestling with this uh, uh, thought as well, this age and the age to come. The Messiah has come, the kingdom will come. Uh, we know that Schweitzer uh, coming from a Jewish perspective in terms of the Messiah. Now, the authorship of Romans, as we note here, that, that Paul does have a method, uh, and it's the way we would coin dictation, or the process of writing down uh, from source, the exact words uh, written. And so Paul is using a dictation device or a tool uh, where he is using someone else to write down uh, the passages, the verses, in a sense, the letter that he will give to the Church of Rome. And so we know that Tertius is the one who is um, receiving the dictation from Paul. And different arguments come in the sense, well, was it long-handed? Was Tertius writing it in longhand, or, or did he have little freedom to invoke his own uh, thoughts? Is, is he writing in shorthand, or is uh, Tertius filling in the details? Or is simply Paul giving him an outline, and Tertius is responsible for all of the recording of the content, and so therefore there's much freedom? Uh, within the evangelical thought is that there is dual authorship, in the sense that Tertius is also the author while Paul is also the author as well. And yet God is guiding both 
of these human writers to write down his very word. Now, dictation theory also goes into the historical precedents, looking at others in past times, also using writing secretaries such as Cicero, uh, using other individuals to record history and facts. Contracts were also used by uh, a person and a secretary to write down the exact words and the one giving that contract out. Of course, in the rabbinic tradition, the, the drafting of the Mishnah, taking down that which was oral in tradition and then actually writing it down in written form. Uh, I have to mention that there was also theological significance about the Book of Romans and why this is so important to entrust to anyone this important message of faith in Jesus Christ. And so here you have two individuals in whom God was working through, inspiring and giving them the ability to write his words for the Church of Rome and now for us uh, in the church as well. So authorship of Romans, dictation theory certainly is a part of the background and at least the introduction of why we believe the words written here are God-inspired words and they have authority, they have prominence, and we can trust God's word and uh, why we can also apply God's word in our life. Now, the Book of Romans does have unity. When we speak of unity, we're saying that the themes are interchanged, they're working together, they have a message, they have a direction by which the author had sent out to deliver. For example, Romans chapter 1 through 14, there's the matter uh, of early arguments that these were the chapters that began Paul's writings. And then others came along and said, no, it seems like that the writing secretary added chapter 15 and 16, or just 15 alone. But we can come to full assurance that Paul was the writer of this entire letter and that he used the writing secretary and his name was identified at the conclusion of the book, Tertius. And here Tertius is writing and helping Paul complete this task of letter. Uh, to the Roman church. One of the th highlights why I believe in the unity of the book of Romans, particularly coming from the Apostle Paul and secondary from Tertius, is that you have the wonderful doxology in chapter 16, and that parallels what he already had given in chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. So be encouraged by that, that you see the parallel of themes and unity between the, the two bookends as you come to um, the, the beginning of the book and then when you come to the end of the book of Romans. Now, Romans has a date and a place of its writing. And of course, all of Paul's and John's or Peter's, book of James, Jude, uh, even as we consider the New Testament gospels, we can even go back to the Old Testament, find the place uh, the writing, the, the era in which the prophet was writing, the era in which the gospel writers are writing the narrative account of, of the Lord Jesus. And then now, as we consider this book for our study together, we're going to give a date roughly uh, 55 to 56 AD. is probably Paul's third missionary journey. And here he is before the Roman uh, proconsul Galileo. And uh, most theologians, Bible scholars would say Paul seems to have uh, possibly written this book uh, in Corinth as he's appearing uh, later uh, before the proconsul and finding what he's going to find out in terms of his death sentence uh, and such. So that, that will help us as we frame the rest of the theological movement of the book as we move ahead. Of course, when we are looking at the book of Romans, we are attributed to a local church, and this church is called the Church at Rome. We don't know who started the church. We know that Paul is writing to them, and he is going to give a theological uh, summation of the doctrine of justification. So there is no clear statement that, that Paul is the one who started the church, nor uh, is it Peter. Uh, now, some theologians have attributed that these this church was started by Peter just after the, the days of Pentecost as the church and the disciples were moving outside of Jerusalem. 
but possibly um, it could be that as the disciples were converting other disciples that the message of the gospel began to spread, uh, as does Paul's ministry as well later on. But uh, we would uh, be safe to say that we just don't know. Uh, but definitely that the writings, this letter was written by Paul to the Roman church, and the founder of it is unknown. Now, with every church, there's a composition of the people that make up that local church. And in this case, the Roman church is made up both Jew and Gentile. Remember, the Gentiles are non Jewish descent. They are a mixture of other ethnicities. And so both Jew and Gentile are now worshiping together under the gospel. And as these Jewish people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, they're bringing their cultural roots into the local church. And so Paul is needing to uh, teach and admonish uh, the disunity that is being caused uh, by the adding on of justification by faith alone. And so the reference of both Jew and Gentile are, are seen in chapters 9 through 11. Also, if you go to chapter 14 and 15, you'll also uh, uh, see the term appear again. The Gentile Christians, we find that uh, they are affluent and they're strong. Uh, we also know that uh, during the time and occupation of the Jewish ethnicity in Rome, the city, they are arguing over a man named Christus. You can go back historically to look at that. And of course, there's the textual argument in chapters 11 through 13 that Paul realizes that the majority of the Gentiles are there and that they need to care and listen to their Jewish friends that are coming to the gospel. And so you'll see that structure uh, emphasized in those sections. Now we want to continue to drill down on the purpose of the book. So we're, we're moving through this introduction to at least set the stage for the foundation of the chapters that will proceed from here. Now the purpose of Romans uh, seems to be threefold. Number one is evangelistic, that Paul is setting out the fervor and the purpose of the gospel. It's moving towards Spain, and he needs the church's help in this evangelistic um, vision mission that he has uh, to see the gospel go to the ends of the earth. And so chapter 15, verse 19, uh, at least references that. And so that's helpful for us. I, I think secondly, it's pastoral, that Paul himself is a pastor, as, as he is the apostle uh, but he has a pastor's heart. He shepherds these churches along. He's in much pain. Uh, he, he has uh, some sleepless nights, as he says, uh, not in Romans, but in uh, his letter to the Corinthians, that he cares for them. And he cares for the Roman church as well. And so he encourages the church to be unified, to show unity of heart under the Lordship of Christ. And so when we think of a pastor, we think of a pastor as a shepherd, as a teacher who exercises authority, not lording over the people, but comes alongside and aids and disciples and cares for the flock. Uh, third, apologetically, he is on mission to, number one, defend his apostolic ministry of grace uh, toward the Gentiles, but also to counteract the arguments that the Jewish or the times of Judaism is causing um, some tension in, in the church. Jewish Christians have accused the Apostle Paul of denying the Old Testament. You'll see references to that in Romans chapter 2 all the way through chapter 8. And his intention is to show that the gospel of God's grace through faith in, is rooted in the Old Testament and then fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ the Messiah. And so three things, he's evangelistic, he's pastoral, and he is apologetic as he defends his, his apostleship and the message uh, and writing uh, to the Roman church. Now, um, Paul does face um, some tumultuous situation. He, he faces problems. Uh, we, we know in chapters two through five, he's being criticized as an antinomian. He's uh, you know following the ways of the law. Uh, we know in chapter six, uh, chapter six through seven, uh, the argument over sanctification, uh, liberating under this concept of grace, and then chapters nine through 11, 
this whole identity of the relationship between Israel and the church and some in the church uh, and the nation of Israel accuse him of banding the Jews and for the Gentiles. And so those who are Jewish of descent say, hey, you're, you're Jewish, Paul. Why aren't you coming to us? But rather, it seems like you are drifting away from the nation of Israel and aligning yourself under the Gentiles who are in the church. And so, therefore, they accuse him of being apostate uh, to uh, Judaism. Of course, the theme, the central theme, as, as we would like to wrestle this down, would be probably Romans 1, 16 through 17. Of course, there are other theologians that argue contrary to that uh, and might point to other passages of Scripture. But the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God by faith, and we see that development that even by Romans 10, where um, we're asked to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that if God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. It, we so we have that declaration, or these branches that Paul is leaping from. So he starts with his main trunk of the of the tree, this main theological truth, and then from there he'll build his case on what it looks like to be a follower of Messiah, um, the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, um, when we um, want to look at some introductory items, such as an outline, uh, chapters one through uh, chapter three, verse 20, we could classify this section as the righteousness of God needed. Uh, and so in chapters one, all the way verse eight through 32, the Gentiles are, are guilty, and along with the Jews are guilty in chapter Two, and that will take us all the way to chapter 3, verse 8. And then he gives this climatic um, declaration that all are guilty. The entire world is guilty under sin. Uh, number 2 would begin chapters 3, verse 21 through 839, is uh, the section of righteousness of God provided. And so we have that in chapter 3, all the way to chapter 5, is the, the statement on justification by faith. And again, we see that inclusio added in chapter one, where we have the theme, we're, we're declared righteous in God's sight. And just remember the word righteousness is the word justification or to be declared justified. And then chapter six, more the center, we six through seven would be the, the workings of sanctification where we're set apart for holiness. And then chapter eight would be the statement on glorification. It's a great chapter. It's a chapter that should be preached on. I would say the whole book of Romans should be preached, but if you're wanting to do maybe a chapter, um, spending a chapter in a, in, in a six month period of time or three month period of time, definitely chapter eight would be a, a happy spot for you to uh, derive at some principles and application in the life of the believer. Well, then you have chapter three, the righteousness of God vindicated. Uh, and this uh, takes place in chapters nine through 11. And then chapter nine, you have Israel's past riches, what they were in the past under the law. And then you have Israel's rejection. And so Paul uh, begins to raise the pressing issue. And then now the future promise given uh, to the nation of Israel in terms of restoration. Then we move then to the outer, the finality of the book, where we come to the end in chapters 12 through 16, the righteousness of God demonstrated. And chapter 12 is much spent on uh, the ministry, the application of the spirit. Uh, we are to be a living uh, sacrifice unto the Lord. And then our work in society and then uh, dealing with the uh, much controversy that was taking place uh, within the church. And Paul um, ending his book in chapter 11, giving some final greetings to those who are serving in the church. Well, this ends our introduction to the book. Uh, you may want to rerun the PowerPoint video again, uh, and I hope you were encouraged at least by some of the initial uh, comments for the overview as we come to a close.